All right, folks, Caroline here from Chalkbeat. I'm getting us started in just a few moments. We're so happy you're here. Um, I'd like to start uh, by showing a video. So we heard from some of you that it's a little bit, of, little bit complicated to know what district you're in. Uh, so just in the few moments until we start, I'm gonna show a quick video that makes that easy. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. And I'd like to give credit to Chris, uh, Kristen Shears for creating this video for us. So let's watch it really quick and then we'll get started. Hi everyone. Here's a quick video guide to help you find your Shelby County School Board District. You can easily access this information from any computer and even your phone. First, log into shelbyvote.com. Be sure to type in shelbyvote.com and not .org. This is the Shelby County Election Commission site. It has a bunch of information and updates to better support you as a Shelby County voter, but that's a video for another time. Click on the menu and then select voters. Scroll down to what districts am I in and select that. Here you'll see simple instructions on how to easily use this software. Click on the hyperlink below the instructions. Wait for the page to load completely. Now, at the top of the page, enter your address and city name. We'll use a house I found on Zillow that's for sale. Click on your address. Now, here's a trick that helps me. Click on the X in the box, then zoom in. Click on the black dot, and another blue bar will pop up. Look for the one of two. Click on the blue bar, then click on the arrow in the top right corner, and there you go. You can see that this address lives in Shelby County School District 5. Now click at the bottom, Complete Election Details, and it'll direct you to more voter information. Select the link that says County General and State Federal Primary. Select Key Dates, and at the top left corner, you'll see a list of Shelby County School Board seats that are up for election this year. That's it. Happy voting. All right, folks, um, we're super excited to get started. Uh, thank you to attendees for joining. Thank you for to, uh, candidates for joining. Uh, candidates, while I'm giving some quick housekeeping rules, go ahead and start your video so we can see you. Um, I'm Caroline Bauman. I'm with Chalkbeat. Um, and I'm super excited to be here today with you all. So a couple quick housekeeping items, and then I'm going to turn it over. Um, to our moderators for tonight. Um, so first of all, attendees, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, please use the Q&A box, which you're, if you're on Zoom, should be at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. Please use that box to submit questions to the candidates. We're gonna have a time later tonight for audience Q&A. It'll actually be a time moderated by a Shelby County School student. So we're really looking forward to that and looking forward to seeing your good questions. So please submit them there. Um, you'll also see the chat box. We don't have time tonight for um, the raise your hand feature for attendees. We don't have time to hear from you directly, unfortunately. Um, so instead of using raise your hand, if you're an attendee, please use the chat box for any issues that come up, any tech issues, we're happy to answer them there. My um, colleague Susan, who's also on this call, will be helping me out there as well as helping me collect uh, audience questions. Um, we'd love to get a fill for who's in the room really fast. Um, so I'm just going to start a quick poll uh, that we'd love for you to uh, we'd love for you to answer. It should pop up on your screen, attendees. Um, if you can just take a moment to fill it out, it'll tell us who you are and what district you're coming from. So I'm going to give you all just a few seconds, seeing the results roll in, which is great. Candidates, I'm realizing that I didn't give you guys a, a box here, so you're going to have to put other. I apologize, <laughs> but we can count you pretty easily. All right, for attendees just joining, take a few more minutes to fill it out. I'm seeing that stop, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. All right, so looks like we've got a lot of others, got teachers and students and parents in the house, which is great. 
wide variety of districts. Uh, for those who said you don't know what district you're in, don't worry, we'll share that video with you later. All right. Um, thanks for doing that with you. Uh, thank you for doing that with us. We'll be able to do a little bit more audience interaction here in a little bit. Um, all right, that's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chalkbeat Tennessee Bureau Chief Jacynthia Jones, who's going to introduce our evening. Good evening and welcome to Chalkbeat's 2020 Shelby County Schools Board Forum Part 1. I'm Jacynthia Jones, Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Tennessee, a nonprofit news organization committed to covering education equity in Memphis and Tennessee because we believe that every child deserves an excellent education. With me tonight is Carolyn Bauman, Community Engagement Strategist for Chalkbeat, and Laura Faith Cabetta, Education Reporter covering SCS for Chalkbeat, and your moderator tonight. Tonight's forum will feature in District 2, Reverend Althea Green, District 3, Jesse Jeff, Stephanie Love, and Aaron Youngblood and District 4, Claude Pinkston, Christy Sullivan, and Kevin Woods. Thank you to our partners, MICA, Memphis Interfaith Coalition for Action and Hope, and the National Civil Rights Museum for helping make these forums possible. I would also like to thank the candidates for agreeing to participate in this conversation tonight and for their interest and willingness in serving on the board. And I would especially like to thank all of you our parents, teachers, and interested voters for tuning in tonight. And a quick reminder that we will host a second forum Monday night for districts five and seven. Ahead of tonight's forum, our candidates answered a questionnaire on a number of issues affecting our schools. We'll be emailing you their responses in our voter guide. The ground rules for tonight. For the first part of the forum, Candidates will be asked a series of questions in which they will be asked to rank their answers. The audience can also participate in this portion. Candidates will then have one minute to explain their answers. For the, mod excuse me, for the moderated portion of the forum, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to questions. The questions were not provided to the candidates in advance, although they were given a list of broad topics that might be addressed. Candidates, please be respectful of the time so that we can address as many issues as possible. I'll be your timekeeper and will alert you when your time is up. At that time, you may complete your sentence, but please do not continue on. At the end of our moderated question period, we will open up the forum to audience questions that can be submitted via the Q&A box on Zoom and in the comments on our Facebook Live video. Candidates will have one and a half minutes to answer these questions. The purpose of tonight's forum is to introduce candidates to voters and allow them to share their thoughts and strategies about key issues facing the district. It is not a debate, so there will be no rebuttals or personal attacks against other candidates. As such, the moderator may interrupt candidates to maintain decorum. The moderator may also interrupt candidates to clarify any questions or solicit further explanation on an answer. This forum is being recorded and will be available for viewing on Chalkbeat Tennessee's YouTube pages and later on our website at tn.chalkbeat.org. We're also, we're also broadcasting this live on our Facebook page and encourage you to share the Facebook Live video with your friends who couldn't be here. I believe that's all the housekeeping for now, and we're ready to begin tonight's forum. Turning it over to Laura. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Laura uh, Faith Cabetta, as she mentioned, and I uh, just want to also uh, note that we had uh, Tom uh, Porter also join us. Um, he's in uh, District 4, um, so he just joined us, and so welcome. And so now, um, we're going to do, as Jacynthia said, the first portion will be um, two poll questions um, that the audience can also participate in along with the candidates. Um, and then once we do that, um, we'll have uh, 
the candidates explain their answer. Um, we have one minute, uh, 30 second piece, or I'm sorry, one minute piece, and then we'll show the uh, results of the poll. So the first one we've got, um, it's popping up on your screen right now, so everyone can go ahead and participate in that and click submit. And the question for folks who may be following on Facebook Live is, what is one issue in Shelby County education that you think does not get enough priority or attention? Uh, and we list out several options that folks can vote on and we'll have candidates weigh in on here in a second. All right, we're gonna end that poll here in a second. All right, so um, does any of the candidates want to uh, share um, what their answer was and why they chose that? You'll have a minute to um, explain. You can use the uh, raise your hand feature for that if you don't mind. I'm not seeing any hands getting raised, so that might just be a view on my end. Um, we could manually raise our hands. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Clyde. You have a minute. <laughs> Maybe I'm not into the technology, right? That's all right. This works. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I, I chose about the uh, maintenance, where, where uh, a lot of our schools are not getting the proper maintenance that I feel that it is uh, warranted. Uh, a lot of our schools, the uh, schools that I've taught in, have a lot of issues dealing with um, some doesn't have hot water, some um, the bathrooms are falling down, and um, even the cafeteria area, it's uh, not acceptable for students to be in. So I, I feel that this is one area that we have dropped the ball on and uh, that needs a lot of attention to. All right, thank you for that. I see, now I can actually see the virtual hands up. So uh, Stephanie Love, if you could go ahead. Hello, I uh, selected mental health because uh, although I know that uh, there is work being done with mental health, I think that until we begin to fully address the challenges that our students come to school with and um, support those children and the families, until then we won't fully be able to understand what our families um, go through. I will say that in closing, uh, all of the issues that you put there are most definitely challenges uh, that we are most definitely working on to face. But we have to address the social and emotional trauma that our students endure on a daily basis that sometimes prevent them from being in a position to learn. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Christy, you're next. Thank you. Again, this is Christy Sullivan. I'm a candidate in Shelby County School Board District 4, and I agree with Board Member Love. These are all really critical issues that require attention and focus uh, from our Shelby County School Board, our district leaders, and our administrators. But I selected teacher retention. I think it's really important that we are listening to the wants, the needs, and the desires of the most critical lever that we have towards student achievement, which is the person that's delivering instruction in the classroom every day. So we have to make certain that we have conditions in place to make certain that we're not only recruiting and attracting, but retaining top reformers within our district. It's important to make certain that we have compensation, pay, and performance systems that are going to make certain that we're able to retain folks uh, within our district. We know that we operate within a competitive marketplace when we think about the fact that we have different types of school offerings that are available. And I want to be certain that we have policies and practices in place to make certain that Shelby County re remains an employer of choice for teachers and educators. Thank you. Time. 
Okay. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Aaron, you are next. Good evening, everybody. My name is Aaron Youngblood um, with District 3 for Shelby County Schools. Um, so I chose access to technology. Um, I know that here recently, uh, due to COVID, um, access to technology has been a really big issue. Um, however, prior to COVID, of course, um, technology is something that I feel that students definitely should have been had access to. Um, and not just access to the technology, but also um, access to courses that help them improve their digital literacy. Um, I think that <clears throat> technology is a way for students to build wealth. It's a way for communication. It's a way for sharing and disseminating information. And so um, I think that we need to um, get our students into the 21st century. Okay, great that all of y'all are uh, answering different uh, choices there. Um, Reverend Al Green, you are next. Thank you. I think all of the choices were great, but I wanted to zoom in on mental health issues. And I think until we begin to address and teach the whole child, we will become successful as a district. Uh, until the district operates 100% as a trauma-informed district, until you can understand the why I'm acting out, why I'm crying out. And I think that's an area that we must continue to invest in and spend in. Thank you. All right, uh, next is Kevin Woods. Uh, need you to unmute, sir. Looks like your phone is the one that is muted. See if I can do it on my end. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, go ahead. All right, thank you so much for that. So, um, like my colleagues indicated, uh, many of these issues uh, are important. Uh, matter of fact, they all are, but when you ask the question about which ones are getting the least amount of attention, uh, the school system just approved uh, digital devices for all students, so obviously technology is getting a great deal of attention. Uh, cleanliness in schools, obviously with COVID-19, our board has pushed for millions of new resources uh, to go into cleaning our schools and teacher compensation, teacher retention, our chief of HR is, is leading in that effort, particularly during this climate. So all those issues I think are getting ample attention as rightfully as they should be. The one item that I think is not getting enough attention is around expulsion and uh, the suspension of our students, particularly our black males. Uh, right behind me is a book I just finished reading uh, called American Prisons. And when you look at the correlation between student expulsion and the, uh, and, uh, the school to prison pipeline, uh, we got to be laser focused on protecting our black boys, our, our boys of color, and the best the best place for them to be is in schools. And when we started Hi. to measure that as a district, we realized that that's how we're going to move the district forward is keeping our boys in school. Okay, thank you so much. And then last before we um, uh, reveal the audience answers is uh, Jesse Jeff. Good afternoon. My name is Jesse Jeff and I'm candidate for school board district three. Uh, I agree with Mr. Woods about the uh, prison, uh, school to prison pipeline. Uh, prisons are built on the matriculation of third graders. Uh, the number of third graders that pass, uh, that, how, that determines the number of prisons that are built in the country. Former law enforcement, I'm definitely concerned about the end of the school to prison pipeline. But for this survey and Shelby County Schools, I chose teacher retention. If we're going to be a world class district, we've got to attract and we've got to pay our teachers what they're worth. They're degreed professionals. They went to school to do this. Education is so important for me and everybody that I know, uh, uh, education. So we need a known and published salary schedule for teachers. We need, uh, teachers should be able to take sabbaticals to go uh, and get further training or education. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to attract them. So I say in okay. order to be a work class, we need to be uh, focused you, on Jesse. teacher retention. Thank Appreciate you. that. Okay, so yeah, we're going to uh, reveal the audience uh, uh, poll results there. Seeing, I think every, um, every answer was mentioned by some of the candidates. Um, looks like the most popular answer was student mental health supports. Very interesting, okay. Uh, and now we're going to go into um, the uh, second uh, polling question that should be uh, showing up on your screens now. And for those who are on Facebook, 
um, the question is, who has the most impact on a child's ed education? The, um, the choices are parents or guardians, educators, district management, county government, and state government. Give you a few seconds to uh, complete that poll. All right, so um, now back to the candidates. Um, who would like to um, share their answer in one minute on uh, explaining that? If you could use the raise your hand feature. All right, the first I'm seeing is uh, Jesse Jeff. Go ahead. Yes, I think that uh, my first teacher was my parent, my mother. My auntie was a teacher, and because she was a teacher, uh, I became a teacher. My cousin became a teacher. My other cousin became a teacher. So it does begin at home. But the person who stands in front of the kid has the most profound impact on that child. Uh, I can remember great teachers that I had coming up. I went to Humes. I went to Grant. I went to Westside. So the educator, the teacher who is in front of a, the student has the most impact and a lifelong impact. As teachers, we touch everybody. We touch doctors, we touch dentists, we, we touch lawyers. So teachers, educators have the most profound effect on students, in my opinion. Thank you, Jesse. Um, the next I see is uh, Mr. Porter, go ahead. If you can first, yeah, there you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I do agree with all the res responses to that question. But um, I'm a big proponent on if we can teach children how to teach themselves, then they will have the, uh, the most impact on their education. I think it starts at the state level, who, um, which sets the curriculum. If we can get the curriculum right and pass it down to the, uh, on the school level, then we can help children uh, teach themselves. So teachers are a, a big impact and the parents are a big impact as well. But the one thing that we have to get children to understand is we have to learn how to learn and learn how to teach them to um, teach themselves. Okay, going rogue on the answer. So you're saying students. Yeah, I'm sorry, students. Great. Okay. Um, next I see is Stephanie Love. You can go ahead. So uh, I pick parents and I pick parents because as a mother, um, birthing a child, birthing a child and promising to love and support and be there for their child uh, begins the day of birth until even after um, that child leaves school. Uh, what we know is the more parents that we have engaged and involved in their child's education, the more accountability is placed on the school system, which requires everyone to step up. Now, financially, uh, the city, I'm sorry, the county and the state, they most definitely have a great impact on the educational system because if they don't give us the funds, we may not be able to provide all the resources. But most definitely as a parent, I have the most impact on uh, anything that relates to my child. So pushing our children and encourage our children to do great through every day, every walk of life, whether they're in school or not. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, next I see is Aaron Youngblood. Thank you, Laura. Um, I chose state government um, mainly because um, the state funds our education system, right? We wanna make sure that our students have the resources so that our educators can make that impact so that parents and guardians or guardians are more um, understanding of what's going on in schools um, and that there's space for them to actually become more involved in the schools. And I think that all starts from the funding aspect. And if we don't have funding, uh, we can't have any of those other things in order to most impact the child's education. Okay, thanks for that. And then uh, last before we, that I'm seeing uh, is Kevin Woods. Laura. Thank you. Um, so uh, can you hear me again, Laura? Just wanna make sure I'm not mute. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I, I chose, I chose uh, educator as well. Uh, there's a famous quote that says, one child 
one teacher, a one, one book, one pen can change the world. And I'm where I am today because of, of great teachers. Uh, they truly have the biggest impact uh, on uh, education, and we should treat them as such, uh, which, is, uh, which is what we're trying to do now. It's continue to support our educators, but truly the, the, the biggest impact is the educator in the classroom. Thank you. And, and Clyde, did you want to chime in and you couldn't find the hand part? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, cannot ahead. find my hand waver. <laughs> okay, you got a minute. Go ahead. No. Clyde, Clyde okay. you got to get it together now. <laughs> I know it, man. I know it. Um, okay, so, you know, the one thing that I, I, I thought about was uh, an educator. Um, I didn't know that I wanted to be an educator when I came to Memphis uh, from the military. And as I have taught so many students and I feel that I have impact so many student lives uh, talking boys out of gangs because you know the education is not the only thing that we deal with with students uh, we're counselors as well as educators and a lot of times we have to uh, try to help a child find their way not only through education but also through life so I, I feel that the educator is always there to uh, help their child get through a, a lot of tough things that they may be going through in life. So um, that's why I believe that the educator is, is extremely important in a child's life. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that concludes the first portion of our questions. And um, thank you um, uh, for the audience for participating too. Here is the results that you put in. We've got uh, parents and guardians as the the top answer there. So 57% of folks um, choosing that with educators not terribly far behind. No one chose county government. <laughs> all right, thank you all for participating. Um, so the next section of questions that we're going into um, are uh, uh, more long form. Um, they're going to be uh, candidates will have two minutes um, to share their responses if they want to chime in on the particular question. Um, and we're hoping this portion will last about 35 minutes or so. Um, so, f and then uh, if you want to um, chime in on a particular question, again, use the um, raise your hand feature panelists. Um, and if you're having trouble, just let me know. Um, so, for the first question, um, obviously what's on top of mind for everyone um, in this season is what returning to school will look like um, during this pandemic. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, we heard from students, we had um, a few students uh, join us um, just to go through some of the questions that they had um, and to inform kind of how we shaped uh, this forum. And um, one of the things that they wanted to ask was, do you think the current approach, either all in person or all online, um, is the right one as SES resumes school in the fall? Why or why not? All right, um, Althea Green, I'm seeing your hand. You can go ahead, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. I think right now the two choices that we are posing to parent in person or virtual learning are great selections for us to offer to parents. And the reason why is that regardless uh, if parents choose in person or virtual, we'll be guided by the health department's decision and other recommendations. But we have students who really, really are longing to be back with classmates because we've been out so long, so I do understand in person, but for those parents who don't trust it and worry about numbers and virtual learning, it's a great choice. We're gonna provide technology. So I support the choices that the district are offering to our parents right now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Christy, I see your hand next. Thank you. As a parent uh, and as a community member, I certainly uh, applaud the work that the district has done. And I do believe that uh, the ability for parents to choose and decide if they would like for their children to learn uh, in person or virtually uh, by the semester, are the, those are the right choices for us to have as a community. However, I do think that we need to continue to be forward thinking and that 
Shelby County Schools needs to continue to lead the nation in this conversation. And we do need to continue to be nimble and to make uh, a, a de adapt to the current um, environment that we're operating in. And so we don't currently see that the curve is flattening. As a matter of fact, our numbers are spiking here in Shelby County. So I do think that we need to continue to monitor and evaluate the system and work in the best interest of the safety of our students, our teachers, and our greater community. And perhaps we need to give consideration and follow suit as some other large cities and districts have done, like Atlanta Public Schools, Nashville, uh, Houston, and other sites have made the determination that they would like to go all virtual, perhaps for the first month of the fall semester. So I do believe that we need to continue to monitor the situation. And if um, it looks as though we cannot continue to move forward with in-person options that, you know, provide a safe working environment for our teachers and for our students to learn in, then we should give some consideration to going all virtual for the first month or so, or under the guidance of the health department. Okay, thank you, Christy. Uh, Jesse, you're next. It's almost as if Christy is reading my mind. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've given this quite a bit of thought. Um, and if I would feel comfortable in sending my kids back to school during this pandemic. First of all, we know that there are about 15,000 positive cases in Shelby County. As of yesterday, there was 466 new cases in Shelby County. So I think if we're going to do it, first of all, there should not be a finite date. Like you say, you start on the 31st or you start on the 13th. I think it should be gradual. We should test, we should trace, we should isolate. And until the positivity rate goes down to about 5% for about a two week period, I don't think we should go back because what you're not taking into consideration uh, are the, is the health and safety of teachers, financial secretaries, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, and, and not only that, the students, but then they can bring it back home to the families and then it continues to spread. So I, I'm thinking like uh, Ms. Sullivan, uh, that maybe for the first semester, it should be virtual because I don't think we're down far enough now uh, with the positivity rate. And as a matter of fact, it's spiking and people aren't taking masks seriously and it may continue to go up and we may have to shut down again anyway. So until we look at the data, the scientists, that's who I want to listen to, data, scientists, medical officials, and not politicians, because they have economics on their mind as, a part, as opposed to human capital. Got it, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, you're next. The fact that Shelby County Schools um, even thought enough of our parents to give them two options shows that we are most definitely putting our parents at the forefront um, I think that both, both options are available for parents to choose, um, but also going back to the fact that regardless of the plans we put in place, COVID-19 is going to determine what plan we actually follow. So even though we have those two plans in place to give parents options, because that's what it's about, making sure that parents have choices, uh, COVID-19 will most definitely determine those options. And as a school district, um, and also as a current board member and my fellow colleagues and especially our superintendent, uh, he's most definitely stated, if the numbers continue to rise and it is determined that our students and our educators will not be safe in the buildings, we will most definitely go to virtual learning, which is why we have purchased digital devices for all of our students, not just K-12, but also our students in pre-K. So we are most definitely prepared for whatever happens to continue the educational uh, an academic process for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, next is Kevin Woods. Thank you, Laura. First, I want to uh, mention earlier today, I sent out an email to all the administrators leading this work just to say thank you. Uh, I think it's a, 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 a thankless job at times where they're doing the heavy lifting uh, and we don't thank them enough. And so I just want to, again, thank my colleagues and mostly thank the administration for the great work that they're doing during this time. Uh, I couldn't have said it better than uh, those who are running in District 4. Uh, almost sounded as an endorsement. It says continue to lead during this time. And that's what we're doing. Uh, us, pu us pushing forward uh, a plan that says we're going to continue to let the science dictate where we go as it relates to COVID-19. Uh, as a parent of, of kids in Shelby County Schools, 
I wouldn't put my own children in harm's way, and I'm not going to do that to anyone else in District 4 or throughout the county. Uh, I got confidence in this administration that they're looking at the science and the data, and we should be really thinking about our educators during this time as well. Anybody just sitting through this Zoom call is painful enough. <laughs> no disrespect, Chalk B, but the idea of our teachers being asked to teach kids for six plus hours a day is a heavy, heavy lift. And we need to be thinking about them. It's not a question of whether or not it's going to be virtual education. It's how great would virtual education be so we can be proud of the tool that we put in place for our teachers and students. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And Clyde, learn how to use that button. <laughs> go ahead, Clyde. you got to unmute yourself, and then we, you can go ahead and have your two minutes. Yeah, I'm trying to find that button. Oh, try it one more time. You had it. The unmute button. Looks like a microphone. There you okay. go. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, let me let me thank my uh, colleague, uh, mm -hmm. my brother, uh, Mr. Woods, for his lead on getting laptops for our students. I, I really appreciate that. Um, but I I always say follow the science. We have to follow the science. It's not about politics. I, I agree with what everybody was saying. And I thank that um, I thank our superintendent for taking lead on this as well. And we have to be concerned about our, our students as well as our teachers, as well as the administrators who work in the school building. Uh, this is a very serious, serious disease that is out there. And we have to protect those that we are uh, trying to educate. So we need to follow the science and continue to uh, look over the data each and every time while we are trying to move forward uh, with our education. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. Um, all right, Aaron, you're next. Um, so delaying education for our students, we know is not an option, right? Um, so um, I think that uh, the uh, SES has done a great job of reaching out to get um, input from parents, which I think is very important. We're going to need as much community input as possible to come up with the best plan, right? Um, and in doing that, we have to make sure that we have the resources to do so, right? Um, and so, you know, and being in the classroom as a former educator, I know that kids learn best in person. Um, and so until we can have um, two weeks of no new COVID cases in Shelby County, um, until we can go back to having school board meetings in person, um, and just having more staff input into this conversation, um, I don't think that we should uh, allow our students to go back to school just yet. Got it, okay. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, as some of you might know, the, the state is uh, going to be providing lawmakers with a plan to transition 27 schools in the, the Achievement School District um, by January. Um, what do you think should be included in this plan to support families and improve stu student learning? All right, Stephanie, I see your hand. Thank you. So as a parent who uh, personally went through that process with the Achievement School District, taking control over schools in the Fraser area, the first thing that needs to take place is most definitely parent engagement. As parents, we were most definitely not involved in the process. Uh, nobody asked us what we wanted. Nobody asked us uh, how we felt. Nobody involved us in the planning process, which had us in a position where we felt like it was a hostile takeover. So in this new plan, parent engagement, parent communication must be at the forefront. Uh, parents know what's taking place inside their children's school. Parents know what's going on in the community. They know what's needed. Uh, we may not have all the answers, but we most definitely have some of the answers that will ensure that this process is not another uh, hostile takeover, where it will be a, a smooth transition where we are addressing not only the education, we're addressing the mental health, we're addressing the after school activities, we're addressing the sports, and we're addressing anything that parents feel is a top priority because they're the ones sending their children to school every day. Thank you. Okay, um, Althea Green, you're next. Thank you, uh, awesome question. And I think Stephanie hit 95% uh, of it uh, on the head. Parents must be involved in conversations when we are talking about 
having students to transition from one form of education to another form. So as we are preparing to accept those schools back into the district, I think they need to also be mindful of funding. Those students have been gone from the district for some years. When you go back and look at the success, of, of some of the academic data concerning those, those scores are very low. And so those children are coming back farther behind than they were when they left the district some years ago, which means we need dollars to come back with them, extra dollars to provide extended learning days, to provide some Saturday schools and, and, and other resources that will be needed in order to bridge that education gap that they will come back to face. Yes, we welcome them in. We want parents involved at the table, a part of the conversation, making decisions about the education of their children. But please send some dollars back with those children so that we can do uh, more than, than we need to do to make sure that they are able to get a, a very good education and we receive equity during that process. Thank you. All right, Jesse, Jeff, you're next. I agree also, I think that parent must, parents must be an integral part of anything that uh, the state puts down as far as ASD schools are concerned. I think that all schools should be funded equitably, where if all schools were funded equitably, there would be no need for ASD. There would be no need for charter schools because your neighborhood school would have everything that it needs, the resources, the educators, uh, so to speak. Uh, I just think that for example, I worked at an optional school. All schools should be considered optional schools if they were funded equitably. Everybody should get the same resources and everything. There's some great things going up in my community right now, like Porter Leaf has excellent pro programmatic uh, needs for the children. They uh, do a lot of pre-K. They support 6,300, over 6,300 uh, impoverished families in the community. And so there's some great things going on Yet and still, it needs to be funded equitably, and everybody should play by the same rules also. And not only engaging the parents, but you should engage the parents, the teachers, the unions, everybody in the community should be a part of the conversation. All right, Kevin Woods, you're next. Laura, the best thing about serving on the Shelby County School Board or being a policymaker uh, in general is knowing when to listen and let someone else lead. Uh, few few policymakers are more in tune with what's going on in ASD than Stephanie Love. She's leading this work in her community. She, she's leading on the policy. Actually, we could have went to another question when she finished talking. The truth is, uh, what we didn't talk enough about was how do we get in this spot in the first place? We were sold a bill of goods that someone else could come into our communities, educate our students better, displace our teachers, and when you fail at that, you say, here it is. It's right back in your lap. Now go back and fix it. The truth is, it's hard to educate poor children. When you grew up poor, it's tough work. Let's admit it. Let's say it to our teachers. Let's stop the game of high stake testing and let's support our families. And when we make it about children, we all win. And what do you think should be included in that, uh, that plan to support families like you're talking about? As Stephanie indicated, it's about resources. It's about making sure that we receive the funding. Uh, obviously, the ASD receive additional dollars to support those schools in the, in the turnaround work. It's professional development to support the educators. It's making sure that those teachers that could potentially be, be displaced, much like uh, uh, my friend in District 4 indicated, is how can we support those educators, provide the right resources to them, and, and bring them into the fold of our system that, quite honestly, is doing great work. These schools should be just like the the model we have with, with our iZone schools, and they should be, uh, just like we announced last year, with 22 new reward schools within Shelby County Schools, the children that attend the ASD schools deserve the same right of a quality education that we could start in a pre-K program and be able to graduate college and career ready. So it's gonna take resources, but it's gonna take talent in those buildings as well. Okay. Um, Chrissy, I see your hand. Thank you. Uh, there, there have been a lot of great points that have been shared here. So I'll just add quickly that I believe uh, one of the other things that we need to make certain we play, pay close attention to during this transition phase is the role and the value of community engagement. The fact is we don't have enough time, space, or resources, particularly in this current environment 
uh, of living through a pandemic to be able to do the heavy lift of educating our most at-risk children uh, with the limited resources and capacity that we have. So it's really important that in addition to engaging parents and families and educators, all of that is great work. We also must make certain that we are engaging community members, those that are traditionally involved in the education process, but reach out and touch those that are deeply embedded and indigenous leaders within our community that aren't necessarily traditionally involved in the education of our students. They can be great re resources and make up for some of the lack of funding um, and capacity that we have within our district. We know that in so many communities, our schools are cornerstones and longstanding institutions of support within our community. And so it's time that we touch alumni, we touch taxpayers, neighbors, and voters who are living in those communities, whether they have school-aged children or not, and embrace these students. Because regardless of who the authorizer is for the school, these are our children and they're a part of our community. So we're gonna to have to come together and make certain that we are building a blanket of support for our students. Thank you for that. And Clyde, I see that you got the, the raise your hand feature. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, we need to un unmute yourself first and we can hear you. Sorry about that. No um, I believe that we first of all need to do as um, I heard Jesse say earlier, you know, we need to get the whole community involved. Uh, these kids have been growing up within their community. The community knows them. The church knows them. And we need to pull everybody in. And I even think that it would be even good to uh, pull in those who are patrolling the area to pull them in as well to uh, conversate as to how to go about doing what we're doing. Um, we don't want anybody to be left behind when we're trying to do a transition of schools. So I think that we need to bring everybody in, just like everyone has been saying, we need to bring everyone in to talk about the whole situation and get an understanding from the beginning as to how to do things. Where we mess up is, is when we leave people out of the, uh, out of the ring and uh, just go ahead and do things like we have that, like, you know, it has been done in uh, days before. And so we need to uh, give parents an opportunity to have their say so as well as the community. Thank you. Great. Um, let's see here. Um, all right, so moving on to the next question. Um, we have um, this question here. Uh, the protests uh, sparked by George Floyd's killing highlighted ongoing conversations about racial equity in schools. What should the district do to ensure students and staff understand racism and its effects? Hmm. Aaron, I, I see your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, so I believe one of the first things we do need to do is uh, look at the curriculum that is being taught in schools, especially in our history classes. Um, going through school myself, um, you know, we leave school with this notion that racism is over. It was fixed uh, during the civil rights movement. Um, but I think uh, we need to have uh, deeper conversations about that um, and um, be really careful about who we allow to uh, influence the curriculum that's being taught to our students. Um, and I think that we also need to make sure that when we are telling the story of the history of our country, that we do it from a place of, um, from both sides, right? We don't just make one side seem like they are, you know, the conquerors or that everything is fine and just, and we live in a great nation where everyone is created equal and everyone is free. But I think we also need to tell the, the, the story of the struggle and the story of the conquering. Thank you for that, Mr. Porter. I see your hand. No, I, I agree with Mr. Youngblood about the, uh, the curriculum and the way it's taught in schools. But one, we have to look at how was education, um, how was education brought to America um, in the first place? And so we had to look at the, uh, the Tennessee State curriculum. There are things in place to keep our children from not learning how to read. So if you have things in place and you're a proponent of children not learning how to read, then they won't learn how to read. And so once, once we look at the curriculum and we learn how to, you know, to understand language, then we can um, 
kind of get some of the racism and things that were taught to us to pass down, kind of get it off our backs and chest. But I do agree, we need um, teachers in the classroom who are more relatable. I know they come from different um, types of programs and everything. And so I'm um, just, just overall, I'm kind of lost of words right now because it's kind of in, in intense form. But um, no, but overall, it's just we need to look at the curriculum and understand how can we better teach our students and just a uh, guide is um, a big proponent for language. If we understand what racism is, what it is, is what a violin is, what race is in general, then our students will be able, you know, to understand those words. Like I, I did a um, an article for uh, whatever the um, program was. I think it was commercial appeal, and I was saying, how come our children go into the classroom thinking that algebra is going to be hard or geometry will be hard? If they understand just the word simply geometry means the measure of the earth, then maybe they would take some pressure off us and say, well, hey, it's not going to be hard, but our children come from those same um, children that Mr. Wood says it's kind of hard to educate, but we look at language itself. Everybody can learn language. Everybody, everybody can learn etymology, prefixes, and suffixes, and we can go from there. Got it. Thank you for chiming in. Uh, Stephanie, you're next. I think before we begin to look at the curriculum, which is most definitely needed, I think we have to have everyone who has an impact on our children to believe that our children can learn. We have to have people who believe that our children, regardless of the zip code, regardless of their uh, economic status, regardless of uh, anything, that they most definitely can learn. And I think that's something that has uh, most definitely pre prevented a lot of our children from being in a position to learn. And also, um, you just have to understand that as it relates to equity, as it relates to, first of all, the school system, the system was not designed for all children to learn. It was not designed for all children to succeed. So as a school board member, what we're doing is most definitely dismantling all the negative uh, that prevents our children from learning uh, or even prevent our children from being in school, like the expulsion. Our superintendent, along with the board, we have most definitely said we will not suspend our students for small infractions. If they are out of school, they cannot learn. We have also passed an equity uh, resolution where we are going to make sure our schools, we've already started. Our schools are funded based off the need, not based off the number of students who are in a school because we know there are some schools that need more. Also, our Black Male Initiative, where we are most definitely focusing on that group of students because that's, those are the students who are most definitely in the prison. So there's a lot that we're doing, but first we have to continue to dismantle the system that prevents all of our children from learning. Thank you. All right, Christy, you're next. Thank you. So I would agree that uh, it's really important that we pay close attention to the curriculum and especially to the systems of inequity that currently exist within our, our education system right now. And these are things that uh, are systemic inequities, not only in, an, in our own community, but that we see across the country. But I think it's really important that we operate with an asset-based lens, and I'm challenged with the language of students who are hard to teach or hard to learn, because as board member Love said, we must operate under the belief that all children can learn and can learn at a high level. I think that in addition to looking at the curriculum that our students are being exposed to, it's also important that we make certain that all adults who are involved in our education system have access to the appropriate training and development so that they are able to identify inequities in their day-to-day -day work. It's important that our teachers have exposure uh, to culturally responsive teaching strategies and that they are trained and have opportunities for development in those areas. It's important that all staff, not just teachers and educators, but all staff within our system have access to some type of anti-bias training so that we have the ability to be self-reflective and understand uh, what we bring with us to work each day. So not only do we need to make certain that we expose our children and our students to new curriculum uh, and to new content, but as, a, as adults, there's accountability and ownership that we have as well. And we meet, need to make certain that we're educating and training ourselves so that we can create a welcoming, inclusive, and diverse environment for our students, teachers, educators, and all staff. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Jesse, Jeff, you're next. So when I was in school, we had a class called Civics. And uh, I think we need to go back to that. Uh, we need to, the kids need to know the history of the United States. In the beginning, uh, in the 16th century, when the country was founded, uh, education wasn't for everybody. 
It was only for wealthy landowners. It wasn't for black people because black people were considered one fifth of a person. It wasn't for women. And so now this is a long way coming trying to uh, rectify this situation. So civics needs to be taught again. I have an undergraduate degree in history and I have a love for history because it teaches you uh, a record, a history is a record of man's past. So it shouldn't be a revisionist history, but the truth to talk about uh, what's caused uh, the inequities, the deep inequities and disparities in our country. I think also as it relates to the George Floyd incident, a good start would be the Harris Justice, Justice and Policing Act. And one of the tenets of that act is to take policing out of school. And I think that we have an excellent uh, person in uh, Major Jackson over there who uh, runs the security of Shelby County School. And if we take policing out of schools and just allow the security to uh, handle this situation, I think we would get more equitable outcomes as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh Clyde, you're next. Okay. Um, I've been listening to what everyone's been saying and a lot of things were good. Um, of course, some things I don't agree with, but that's neither here or there. I taught history and, and school and world US history. Uh, I will say that the curriculum does not really uh, give the details of about racism in America. These are things that uh, as a history teacher, I would bring out myself. A lot of times we would have dialogue. Uh, certain days uh, we would not even open the book, but we would sit and we would have dialogue about the things that are going on in America. And I think that our students can relate and understand what a person is coming from once you break it down to them about what is going on in our society. Some things that they are enraged about until it's explained to them. Um, but we do need to look at our curriculum again. We do need to uh, have things in our history book that is more conducive to our, to our students, our African-American students. And um, uh, because everything is not so black and white and so you have to go a little bit further. As, as a person, I was um, military for a long time and I would talk to them about different places that I've been in the world. So, um, and uh, most of them enjoy those conversations, but we need to really try to bring our students to understand what's going on because there's a lot of anger there and we have to calm that anger down and channel it in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Woods, you're next. Laurel, uh, Sam O'Brien, uh, he works with School C, uh, one of our partners, uh, had wrote a, uh, published a, a, an article on equity. And one of the first things he, he had mentioned in that article is that the first thing we must do is, is make a public declaration for the need for equity. Um, and that's what I did as a, as a school board member a, a few years back with a resolution that really called to, to attention the challenges and inequities within our own system. Uh, we said that we must ensure that all of our youth came to school socially and emotionally ready, that our students would uh, be at grade level uh, by third grade because we know the impact uh, of third grade literacy and its impact on graduation level. And then we must ensure that all of our young people, particularly our boards of color, are being, being taught in, uh, about who they are uh, as, as people in order to be able to be productive citizen in the society and that, and that the deck is already stacked against them. Because you know, when you look at the, the, if you overlay the income gap with the education gap, there's a direct correlation with wealth and where we are within our system. And we must be able to talk to our, our students about what is redlining and, and how, and how, how we, this came to be to why we are still seen as less than and, and, and I think George Floyd in that incident brought that to light that we must be doing this. We must be focused, laser focused on this within our classroom. The statement I made earlier about this being hard work and really giving uh, a notion to our teachers and the challenges that they have to take on, because in addition to moving the needle academically, they're also asked to, to make sure that our students know who they are and know where they come from. 
which is why I'm excited about the work that Mike Lowe is leading in our equity office, about the fact that we're pushing uh, curriculum within our schools. We're focused on uh, anti-racism uh, training, professional development for our, for our teachers. And I believe we're moving in the right direction. But it is tough work, and I don't apologize for owning the fact that our teachers have a very tough job to do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Althea Green. Thank you. I've heard great answers uh, from other, other colleagues sharing this afternoon. But I want us to also, uh, for Mr. Jeff, civics has not left. It is one of those areas that our students are still required to test in as an exit out. But uh, as a former social studies teacher, uh, it's always bothered me that we set aside one month for black history. And so as we continue to move the needle, and, and, and my school board members would agree, I think one of the things we will have to go back and do is push for black history to be taught more than one month and to allow students understand who they are. Uh, it, it, we have work to do. And so I think as we look at curriculum, uh, I was recommended a book by Dr. K.T. Whalum Jr. recently by Otis Sanford. And so me going back to understand the whole political thing with Memphis history, we have to understand who we are. We have to understand how our history is outlined. And before we can under, expect for us to teach it to our students, I have to question if we truly know our history. And so when you realize that in 2020 in Memphis, you have a black county mayor, a uh, black majority on city council, county commissioner, and school board, uh, we have got to come together to work as a team in order to move this needle and to uh, look at our curriculum and make sure that uh, if there are areas that we need to improve in, that we do that in order for students to understand what's going on in the nation, they have to understand who they are and what's going on in our city. Thank you. Great, great. Okay, um, we are actually going to um, stop for an intermission uh, now. Um, and uh, after we come back, it's gonna be about five minutes, you know, go to the bathroom, get some water, whatever you need to do on, on the panel side or on the audience side. I know looking at a screen is a lot. <laughs> um, but after we come back, we're gonna have some uh, questions from the audience presented um, by a student who's been helping us out. Um, and during our intermission, we have a special treat for you guys. We have a um, recording from the Memphis Jazz Workshop, um, a student uh, music group that um, will uh, keep this lively while we're gone. So we'll see you back in about five minutes.
right, we're getting close to all coming back together. Um, and I'm going to uh, introduce um, a student who's going to be helping us uh, during the audience Q&A portion. Uh, her name is Dahlia. Um, I'm sorry, let me get her last name here. Dahlia Townley Bakewell. She is a, a rising 10th grader at White Station High School and a member of the MICA Youth Council. Um, if you want to go ahead and mute and say hello. <laughs> Hello. It's been really fun listening to you guys talk and everything. Yeah, and thanks for helping us um, with this portion. We're going to um, uh, do as many audience questions uh, that we can um, that have come while we've all been chatting together. Um, uh, Dahlia will uh, say the question and then candidates feel free to um, raise your hand if you want to answer. Um, I believe you'll have a minute and 30 seconds and um, uh, we'll move on from there. So go ahead, Dahlia. Okie doke. So this is our first first question. It's from Regina. How will you involve the community in the decisions to move the district forward? And a similar question from Stephen. Most folks don't know their school board member and most meetings are not well attended. How can you make the school board a true community to serve all students? All right, um, Jesse, I am seeing your hand. Go ahead. Yes. How are you doing? Good to see you. Um, I think that the community can become more involved with the district and knowing what's happening by allowing them to participate uh, at a regional, I mean, at a bi weekly or I mean, a bi monthly rather uh, meeting, like a town hall. I think that. Uh, the commissioner should sponsor at least a bi-monthly, if not monthly, meeting uh, of the entire community, not just around election time, uh, but just or when somebody's be coming to a meeting, but actually more so than the board. I think public servants announcement uh, could be utilized as well. And now with COVID-19, we see everything is virtual. Uh, we know we can do Zoom or team meetings as well. So. There are some great opportunities to involve uh, parents and community, uh, especially with the advent of COVID-19. All right, Stephanie. Thank you. So as the uh, current school board member representing District 3, uh, and that's what I'll speak about, uh, I have uh, most definitely pushed for more uh, community and parent engagement by also uh, pushing the district to uh, create more positions for parent engagement. As a board member, I am most definitely uh, always involved in the district activities in District 3, even by hosting, um, I'm sorry to me, I'm sorry. Okay. Even by hosting um, not just events, but also by having conversations with parents on a regular basis. No, I do not always publicize those events, but me just being involved, having conversations, not just with parents, but with the community members and most definitely with each and every principal in District 3, learning what their challenges are, learning what their strength is, and most definitely being able uh, to participate in any process that I can. But also in closing, uh, having conversations with our students, because just like you sitting here, we know that our students have voice, our students have power, uh, and I'm not going to dismiss the fact that more uh, engagement needs to take place. But I am going to say there is a lot of engagement taking place. It may not be publicized. Uh, it may not be shown all the time on Facebook, but it's most definitely happened. And it's happened since 2014, and it has not happened. I mean, it has not stopped happening in District 3. I've always been visible, vocal, and always been present in District 3. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, Christy Sullivan, you're next. Thank you. So as a parent, one of the main reasons that I'm running is because I've often felt as though my voice was not heard and I did not have meaningful opportunities to weigh in and be engaged in my own child student experience. So I would be certain that I would, within District 4, form an advisory council and make certain that we were meeting at least quarterly. This council would be comprised of student leaders, teacher leaders, parents, community members, faith-based leaders, um, who, whomever would like to come out and be representative of those key stakeholder groups that make up 
the people who comprise District 4 because we cannot have a great community. We cannot have a great city without great schools. And all of us have to, as I said before, form a blanket of support for our students. I think it's really important that as a school board member uh, being out within the community that those advisory council meet, uh, meetings, and I would also want to host, co-host rather, town hall meetings with other community agencies that are actively involved and engaged in supporting community members within District 4. It is not incumbent upon the community to reach out to me, but it is my role and my responsibility to make certain that I am reaching out, that I am embedded, and that I am engaged. That's the type of leader that I know that I can be and that I am because of the experience that I have, where I have not felt like my voice has been heard and I've not had meaningful opportunities. And I wanna be certain that I'm increasing agency and that as parents and community members, we have the opportunity to weigh in on key decisions that our district is making that will ultimately impact the experience that our children are having within the classroom and the environment that our teachers are working in. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Clyde, you are next. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Bakewell. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, as a school board member, you are almost as important to the community as one of the educators. As a school board member, I believe that one of the first things that you should do is to be in contact with the schools find out when the PTA meetings are going on, be at those meetings and try to bind some of the schools together to have a, co a, a collective meeting among parents and community leaders. Uh, there are always things going on within the community. Sometimes uh, things dealing with uh, violence, uh, things uh, dealing with bullying. We can bring all of these groups together and to, uh, talk with them about issues that are going on within the community and we and you'll find out a lot of times that each school is almost going through the same thing but as a school board member it is important that you are being seen in the schools not saying that you have to be there 24 7 but everyone needs to know who you are in each in in each uh, uh, school that is in your district uh, a lot of times people don't know who their school board members are and you know that's troubling but um, I know as far as I'm concerned my main thing would be to try to work with parents work with people in the community try to work with the teachers as well and okay. to bring everybody together to do a good job as far as our schools are concerned thank you wonderful uh, Kevin you're next thank you um... The people in District 4 know who Kevin Woods is. Uh, we have, uh, in, the, in uh, Shelby County Schools, we have about 200 institutions, 200 schools, especially including our charters. We have nine board members uh, responsible uh, for leading uh, uh, the policy and promotion of that work. Uh, what was identified earlier with newsletters and uh, community meetings and, and pizza parties, sounds like the PTA, which is why as a parent, I'm an active member of our PTAs. I'm involved in our schools. Uh, in, the, in the world of social media, uh, parents, teachers, and any stakeholder is one tag or one click away from pulling you into any conversation and any issue. What we know as board members is what voters will, will decide is, does he or she listen? Does he or she solve problems? And that is what an engaged board member should do. You should be promoting the great work of your district and you should be taking on the tough challenges. Anyone who says that their voices aren't heard, don't live in District 4. Anyone who says that they cannot reach their board member, don't live in District 4. So what I would say to you is that I'll continue to do the work that I do, which is why I think I was overwhelmingly uh, asked to continue this work, particularly uh, amongst this pandemic, because the families in District 4 can count on me to be available and that's really your role of a school board member. The idea that you're gonna visit every school and be there every day is simply not a realistic expectation of a board member. And if you're doing that, you're not doing policy work. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Aaron, you're next. All right, uh, thank you, Regina. And thank you, Stephen, for that question. Um, similar to what Ms. Sullivan said, um, I believe that um, 
you know, it's imperative for me as a school board member to be able to, um, you know, be close to um, the schools in the community, to be able to uh, just be a, a step away um, if anybody wanted to have a conversation and not just wait until, um, you know, there's an event or until um, there's an issue. And so for me, um, I believe that it's important that, you know, we make sure that we um, are involved um, with parents at, their, at the school, school leaders, teachers, and students, um, and especially uh, organizations that are dedicated to education equity. A lot of them um, are really active here in um, the city, um, such as MICA, um, just being available to those organizations when they bring the issues forward and coming up to, with a plan together that involves uh, the different stakeholders in order to see how we can best move forward. Uh, so always keeping the community involved um, through, like I said, just random visits, uh, popping up, staying visible in the community, and also making myself available. All right, Althea. And I agree. I think a, a good board member is one that's visible in the community. Uh, we are visible in schools. And when it comes to parent communication, uh, all of the board members can agree that we host district meetings where we invite parents to come and meet with us. And, and often when we have our district meetings, I'm disappointed because parents don't show up. And we are there. and We provide dinner. So I know community engagement as a grandparent I mean, the texts that come daily from the school system or sometimes they get on your nerve because we receive texts about everything. But I think as a district, we do a great job of hosting events for our parents. I think as school board members, I can truly say that District 2, everybody in District 2 know their school board members. They live in my district because I am in the community, and, and as well as my colleagues. We're at events on Saturdays when we don't have to be there. We're at churches on Sundays. And so I just want to say that I know that all of us, most of us, try very hard to be in the community to make sure that people know us. It's not about the fact that it's election time and we're campaigning. Every day I act like I'm campaigning and I'm trying to do the best I can to fulfill my duties as a school board member. So we as a district, as a school board, will continue to have events for parents to make sure that they are kept updated about what's going on in this district. Thank you. All right, Mr. Porter, you're the last hand before we go to the next audience question. Yeah, so um, one thing I'm thinking about is, how can you know the community when you're not from the community? Um, I grew up in Orange Mound, graduated from Merrill's High School. And um, when, then when I used to work for Shelby County Schools, you always had uh, people do the public comments and they used to look at current board members and they would be on their cell phones, you know, chatting with each other and it showed a, a disrespect to the um, public. And now, like Ms. Green said, now it's political season that we want to be real responsive and um, act like we really there for the concerns of people in, in, in these pers uh, prospective school districts. But one thing I would do is um, continue to have those community engagement, have those forums, be open to ideas you know, really listen to people. Because when I'm out campus, that's one thing I'm hearing about is we don't even know who our school board member is. You know, we appreciate you coming up, talking to us, you know, because we haven't had that vote of contact in probably for the past eight or nine years. So, um, yeah, that's one thing I'll say to uh, advocacy groups. I think that was mentioned in the comments, Adv advocacy groups, um, monthly newsletters. Uh, we can do that on the regular. And just, just, just at least showing that you care, that you're, you do have an um, open ear, because they do have, again, they do have those public comments. But if we're on our cell phones, if we're chatting with our um, colleagues, if we're laughing and giggling, uh, going to the bathroom, you no, know, that shows a sign of disrespect to the public. So um, that's one small thing that we can change. All right, uh, Dahlia, can you um, give us our next question? Okie doke. So this is our second question. It's from Caleb, a student at East High School. As we know, over 50 schools had a pandemic of its own. Have had a pandemic of their own. Unlike COVID-19, it was lead. How can SCS focus on repairing lead pipes in all schools and focus on HVAC problems given COVID-19? Sorry, that's right, my You can go ahead. So uh, a couple of ways that we can most definitely focus on the lead issue is number one, by uh, making sure that lead testing is done in our schools, uh, which it most definitely has taken place, but also by uh, forming a relationship or building a stronger relationship 
with the city, the county, and the state. Uh, one of our legislative agendas for the 2019-20 school year included a uh, comprehensive plan of how we actually address the lead um, in our schools. We know that our buildings have been in place for uh, some of them 80, 90 years. Uh, so it's going to take not just the school board, but also the city, the county, and the state uh, to help us uh, fix this problem. As a uh, board member, because I most definitely know the ills uh, that cause harm to our children when they are exposed to lead, um, I was actually asked to sit on the, uh, the lead uh, board from the county and uh, most definitely uh, am happy to say that uh, our current mayor, Lee Harris, most definitely uh, uh, accepted my application to sit on that board. So we know that uh, there's something that Shelby County Schools has to do, but also it's going to take a collective action uh, to remove this. And if that means um, tearing buildings down and building new buildings, um, that's exactly what it's going to take. So I'm willing to go uh, through all ends to make sure that when our children drink water, they are not exposed to lead. Okay, we're going to do Jesse, then Christy, and then we're going to move on to the next question. So when you, when you talk about hazards in the school, uh, lead, mold, uh, things like that, uh, faulty HVAC systems, uh, it starts at risk management. Risk management needs to be more accountable uh, to the staff of Shelby County Schools. So as a unitary director for Memphis Shelby County Education Association, I get a lot of complaints. Uh, lead is something you just can't tell that, that is there. There needs to be a test. So I was invited to uh, receive the information from risk management for a particular school that was suspected of having lead. And uh, the levels came back uh, extremely high. And so we reached out to risk management and uh, to see what their solution would be. Yeah, funds come from other sources to resolve these issues, but yet it's still, as someone said, that the buildings are old, the water fountains are old. Uh, that's the first introduction into our students through the water uh, for our students. So again, the risk management needs to be more thorough and accountable to the staff of uh, Shelby County Schools. Thank you. And Chrissy, you go ahead and then we'll move on to the next question. Thank you. This is an issue that is certainly, um, I'm very passionate about and it's very dear to me because I'm a parent of a student who is uh, in a school that was identified as having lead in the water sources there. And as a matter of fact, one of the highest levels uh, of lead was identified within my own daughter's school building. So I take this to heart because I understand the risk and the dangers that are associated with it from a very personal vantage point as it you know, could have potentially impacted my own child. So I think that there absolutely needs to be a parent and a community education component to our risk management uh, and to our remediation plan. I, I have to admit that it was appalling to find out on the drive home one evening at about 530 on the radio as I was listening that my child's school was on the list. Uh, I would have hoped that the district could have been more proactive and more transparent in the communication to parents and to families uh, and to community members. So I think there certainly is an education and an engagement component uh, that we need to engage in uh, as a district and as a community. And as Board Member Love has stated, it means that we need to move forward and that we do need to have a comprehensive facilities plan. We need to present that plan to our Shelby County government, and we need to take a look at what the greatest infrastructure needs are and continue to advocate for funding. And it could very well mean that we need to build new buildings in many of these communities that have aging buildings that are no longer up to code and are no longer safe environments for our children and for our students. Those are the types of things that I would advocate for as a school board member. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dahlia, next question. Okie doke, so question three. Suspensions are issued as young as kindergarten. Does anyone have an innovative plan to help tackle the number of suspensions slash expulsions? Althea, you can go first. I think as we spoke earlier about uh, addressing the emotional and social learning issues that our students often uh, show up at school with each day, 
uh, last year we introduced the reset room, which was a room where students could go to, have a calm down experience, uh, rather than get a suspension, they could talk to someone. And so I think as a district, as we continue to become a trauma-informed district, as we continue to train our teachers to ask why, instead of just writing students up and sending them out, we will continue to monitor those uh, expansion rates. Uh, as far as kindergarten children and our younger students, uh, I disagree sometimes with suspending students because we need them at school every day in order to educate them. And so I think uh, as I continue to sit on the school board, uh, that will be one area that I will look at is making sure that we have a plan for our K through two children that we are addressing their problems, that we're not sending them home for little petty things. He stole a pencil, he pulled somebody's hair, but we are providing counseling and other outlets, other issues to address uh, the behavior problems that they arrive at school with. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie? Like my colleague stated, uh, Shelby County Schools is most definitely in the process of addressing that. But one thing that I'll say too is just uh, one thing we have to do is to stop penalizing our black and brown children for expressing themselves or um, putting them in the position to where we make them feel as if uh, how they act or what they say or what they do uh, is not status quo and it shouldn't take place. Um, I know when I became a board member, um, I just looking at the data um, because I'm always looking at data. I found out that we had a number of uh, kindergarten through second grade students who were suspended um, and not just kindergarten, but pre-K students who were maybe sent home uh, who were spend, suspended um, just because maybe uh, they inappropriately touched a student. But what I asked was, what are we explaining to these students when they do this? And in closing, I remember when my uh, current uh, 10th grader, uh, she was at Delano Elementary and it, she was touched, um, the teacher said inappropriately, uh, but apparently it wasn't that way. And I was just so devastated to learn that that student was uh, expelled from that school without anyone having a conversation with that child or with that parent. And I wonder every day where that student is now, um, because that's something that the student learned. And uh, I feel whatever happens, we should most definitely be having conversations with the parents and the students before we say suspension is the first alternative. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. I see several more hands, but we want to get as many questions in as possible. So I'm going to call on Aaron and then we'll move on to the uh, next uh, question. You can go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, um, I'll take it, Aaron, if you don't want it. I know, I got it, Kevin. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, as a former classroom teacher, um, I often encounter behavior issues in my classroom. Um, but because I was able to be um, more um, you know, have those conversations with my students. I taught elementary school, right? I don't believe that there's anything um, that a kindergartner um, through second grader can do that will warrant them being expelled from school so young. Um, but um, I do know that by having conversations with students, uh, getting to know them more, um, you will learn a lot of things, right? Um, as someone already mentioned, not every school has a reset room, not every school has a behavior specialist. Uh, those are ways that we do need to invest in our schools so that our students are learning more about their um, their emotions and how to deal with their emotions in the most appropriate ways and having people there who are able to have those conversations with students and not just always penalize them for not knowing how to do better. Got it. Uh, Dahlia? Okie doke, so we're moving on to question four. Does Shelby County Schools have resource officers in schools? If so, does the board recommend to remove them from schools, especially given um, the recent events with the killing of George Floyd and other victims of police brutality. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, of course. Um, okay. Does Shelby County Schools have resource officers in schools? If so, does the board recommend to remove them from the schools especially given uh, the events that have happened recently with the killing of George Floyd and other victims of police brutality. Okay, we've got uh, Stephanie, Clyde, Kevin, and Jesse, um, and then we're gonna move on. So go ahead, Stephanie. 
So yes, in some of our schools, uh, we most definitely have resource officers. I think that uh, there most definitely needs to be a deeper conversation uh, as to what's the purpose of the resource officers and making sure our uh, students understand their purpose. I know that uh, board member Woods has strongly advocated for our resource officers to be in plain clothing, not in the uniform that they're in because this takes away from the uh, police perspective. I think that um, we most definitely need to have a conversation around uh, ways that we can not only protect, make sure our schools are protected, but also make sure that our students are not put in a position to where they feel like they're being policed every day. Okay, thank you. Um, Clyde? Um, okay, I believe that uh, it doesn't matter whether the resource officers are in uniform or not. They are needed in the school system. Uh, there have been too many times that I know, and I'm just speaking for me, that I've had to take weapons off of a student before. Um, there are students that come to school that have things that are going on in their lives. And uh, that's why I always said that we need more behavioral specialists in the schools so that we can uh, deal with those uh, students uh, that are in that situation. Um, no one would like to do a suspension. Um, there are times when students will jump up and on a teacher and, you know, I've had times I had to pull a student off a teacher. So there are times when we, you know, the, the, the officers are needed in our school system. And we can't just close a blind eye and say that, you know, if, if uh, we see discipline there, um, I mean, uh, we don't see discipline that we just walk away from it. We have to have discipline. There can be no learning in a classroom if there is not discipline. So we do need resource officers there. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. And for the candidates that you didn't get to, we're gonna have Jesse go. Um, uh, for the candidates that didn't get I to, was, you, I was you can go in the chat. I was and, um, Laura, as a, as, with all due respect, as a incumbent board member with police, I just want a quick response to that since you called my name. Can I get that one, please? Um, I believe we had uh, Jesse next. Yes, um, I will. Thank you. So, oh, gosh. Uh, All right. I think that, uh, you know, I spoke earlier about the uh, Harris Justice and Policing Act that uh, Kamala Harris has sponsored. And one of the features of that is to take police out of the school. I think that we have a great uh, security team at Shelby County Schools. I think Major Jackson does an excellent job and uh, we could use our own resources. Furthermore, I think that uh, a lot of the, the people or the kids, the students have issues. Uh, uh, Shelby County Schools has a great program called CASEL, uh, Collaborating Academic Social Emotional Learning. And uh, some of the things that they identify are grief and loss, anger management, uh, and just how to cope with anxiety. So a lot of stuff is going on with our kids. When I was in the classroom, I could handle my, my kids. I could talk to them. I had that connection with them. I had a connection with the parents. So if you can sit down and relate to your kids and talk to them, um, I think that's a great thing. I think that uh, kids being manhandled, as we've seen on television recently, as young as two, I mean, as second and third grade, uh, that should not ever happen. And I really like uh, uh, Kamala Harris uh, justice and policing that. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Kevin, you can go, you can be our last person uh, to um, answer this question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Caroline to close us out. Thank you, uh, Laura. Again, uh, I think those advocating for a change in policing uh, was happening before George Floyd. I think it ha has been elevated now, but I think we all want to see the same thing. When you got a system where there's more funding going to police, than it is to uh, nurses and counselors, then you have, you have a systematic problem. And I think as a district, we're working toward that. Every time there's a shooting in school, what you see is a state increase. Instead of addressing gun laws, you have the state increase funding in resource officers. And as a system, we, we can only use those dollars to increase. And so probably the first thing we need to do is start turning back those dollars and not increasing those resource officers. But I think the people advocating for this change in, in defunding or addressing the police's challenge, we want the same thing. We want to look at restorative justice practices. We want to look at increasing social workers, nurses in school, and obviously improving our mental health programs. 
Again, I go back to my earlier conversation around poverty. When you start to address the needs in our communities, you have a less dependency on police officers. So out of all due respect, Mr. Pinkston, while our kids may need discipline, what they need more than anything is love and support. And as board members, that's what we should be funding. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I want to say an special thanks to Dahlia for helping us moderate. Um, this is a lot of time we've spent together tonight. And um, I just want to say thank you so much to the folks uh, who have stuck with us on this call and on Facebook Live. There is so much that we didn't get to, and I'm so sorry for that. Um, but I, I hope that this is the start of many conversations. These are the folks who are vying for your school board. They should be easily accessible to you. So if you asked a question tonight that didn't get answered, and there are so many that did, we encourage you all to reach out to them directly, especially as you prepare to vote. Um, I also want to give a, a last thanks to MICA and the MICA School, uh, Youth Council and the National Civil Rights Museum who helped us make this event possible. Um, be looking for an email from, from us at Chalkbeat for those of you on this call. We're going to ask for some feedback for, uh, for tonight's event, how we can make a forum like this better in the future. Um, we'll also include some resources, including our uh, voter guide where we ask the candidates a lot of questions and they go really in depth. So we encourage you to read that before you vote. Um, we'll also include kind of a little cute virtual I'm informed sticker. Um, I'm an info informed voter sticker like you would get if you went to this event in real life. And we long for the day that we can do that with you all, but we're happy that you joined us here virtually. Join us again 530 Monday to hear from districts five and seven. And with that, we hope you guys have a great night and a huge thank you to our, our panelists, our candidates. Um, give yourself a round of applause for making it through a very long Zoom meeting. Uh, thank you for your time and for helping uh, Memphis voters be as informed as possible. We really appreciate it. All right, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Good night. Early Good voting night. starts tomorrow. It does. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good, Good night.